God bless you all and welcome to uh, this episode of the Gospel Bite. I am your brother Lawrence. Uh, we bring this program to you every week and whenever the need arises. And today we are so privileged to have uh, Pastor Gideon Toyosi from Edmonton uh, here in Canada who is here to bless us with the Word of God. And you know this channel is a channel where brethren of like precious faith we bring on anointed servants of God to encourage and share with us the word of God and I will pray that you open your heart to receive the engrafted word which is able to save your soul we are living at a time that we need to live in the present truth uh, meet in due season and so when we have a brother who is here to bless us we are more than privileged to receive the word. So without much ado, I'll offer a short uh, word of prayer. And uh, our brother will come and bless us with the word. Shall we pray? Our dear Heavenly Father, once again, we are gathered at your feet. Oh, to dine at your table. Father, we are just as we are. We have come in greater expectation. Lord, may you anoint our, our ears, our heart to receive your word. Father, I pray for my audience who will be listening to this video, wherever this video finds itself. I also pray for Brother Gideon, who is here to bless us with the word. Lord, may you uh, speak through him and use him as a blessing unto us this day. So that when we go out of here, our hearts will be gladdened. As we walk the Christian journey, in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen. So, Brother Gideon, you are welcome to the Gospel Bite. Thank you very much, Brother Lawrence. I appreciate the opportunity. Amen. So, Amen. my audience, this is Brother Gideon, uh, based in Edmonton. He's here to bless us with the word. God bless you, Brother Gideon. Amen. Shalom. God bless you, brothers and sisters. It's a great opportunity to be speaking to you from this platform that the Lord has inspired our brother to create. And uh, we are grateful for the testimonies that have come from this, uh, this effort that our brother is putting in. Uh, God bless you, Brother Lawrence. Uh, every man, is, uh, every joint is supplying and may the Lord continue to use this platform to reach uh, more people and strengthen the faith of uh, his, his saints all around the world. Uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here today. And so our brothers prayed, and I believe that the prayer is sufficient to uh, carry us through today's sharing. Um, the title of my sharing today that I'll be bringing to you, uh, the Lord willing that it's uh, inspiring uh, will be something I recently wrote about uh, but I'm hoping that the Lord will grant me more grace to expand more on it and that will be passion versus ambition or ambition versus passion uh, depending on how you want to look at it um, the Lord is here to bless us and hopefully we will hear from him so I'll just go straight into it um, so this is these two words are not words that anybody isn't familiar with. Uh, we all know what ambition means. We all know what passion means. But I'm just going to define it uh, in the way that I understand it, and also in the way that uh, it is. Uh, uh, I think the dictionary definition of this also, and then I will be bringing the the thoughts from that definition. So. Let's first define what ambition is. Okay, so um, ambition is when someone has a strong drive to achieve something. Okay, this is we've all been ambitious. Everybody gets ambitious about something that we are trying to get uh, to help us feel actualized to fe help us feel fulfilled or to help us feel uh, gratified so that is really what ambition is you're aiming 
trying to achieve something so that you can uh, feel self-actualized so that you can increase your uh, gratification as, as, as a person okay so the most important thing to note there is ambition is uh, driven towards the, the 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 towards self so it's it's directed to the person who is striving for that thing okay so that's the definition of ambition passion on the other hand is similarly a strong drive just like ambition is however passion is not self gratification um, as a matter of fact passion is mostly self uh, it uses the person who is passionate uh, and the person is self uh, sacrificial to whatever it is that they are uh, passionate about so if for example you are passionate about uh, about a concept, you would often see that you would even forget yourself and uh, the object for which you are passionate, towards which you are passionate, begins to take over your life entirely uh, you, because you are passionate about it. So, passion is, you know, reflecting or it's directed towards something else that is outside the, the person who is ex exhibiting the passion, while ambition is to make the uh, the person feel better so it's self gratifying self uh, actualizing passion on the other hand is uh, is self sacrificial you're sacrificing yourself for this thing that you're passionate about and in most cases when people are passionate about something that concept for which they're passionate takes over their being without them knowing it you know it just takes them over completely and so they become very little and they become all spent you know for that thing for which they are passionate um, so that is I, I hope that sort of differentiates those two uh, concepts sufficiently now I want us to look at to better understand it people have been passionate about different concepts in life uh, we've, we've seen people who discovered a lot of things they're, they're passionate about uh, about that thing uh, but I, I want us to look at biblical examples this is what we are we are uh, our, we are uh, designing our life towards so uh, biblical examples are sort of like a better way to understand passion and ambition in a spiritual from a spiritual uh, uh, context okay so I'm gonna be looking at two examples uh, uh, for these two concepts okay so I'll be comparing two uh, different examples of contemporary people who sort of lived together at the same time so we can understand the difference in what these people exhibited um, I'm hoping that uh, believers out there are most importantly uh, people who are watchmen or people who have any ministry at all will also benefit from this sharing by God's grace okay so the first example that comes to mind when you're looking at example of people that are passionate uh, before we go into the New Testament let us start from the Old Testament let us look at uh, Moses as an example of passion and let us contrast that with another prophet who is his contemporary called Balaam as an example of ambition and let's see the difference between them so first of all there are many things that we can speak to uh, that highlights the difference between these two uh, characters but I want to choose one so we can go right ahead and look at other examples and then I will make uh, some ex some comments uh, about them so let's look at uh, Moses or oh, yeah let's look at Moses Moses was a man who came from being nothing. You know, we can say, yes, he was something before. Yes, indeed, he was something. He was supposed to be the heir to the, to the uh, Egyptian uh, uh, throne. But, you know, something happened. He lost that dynasty or that right and went into the wilderness and was turning to uh, the, 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 the flock of his father-in-law. 
And, you know, in doing that, God met with him. And he gave him a commission. A commission that initially was not interested in. Which the prophet to this generation, the person of William Aaron Abraham, said that that is typical of people who indeed have a call of God on their life. They initially don't want to do it. You know, but God chases them down and ensures that that necessity is placed upon them to deliver on, on the task that has been placed in their hands. And this is what Moses uh, was. He didn't want to do it many times in the conversation that he had with uh, the Lord God. He was deferring the job and even making recommendations you know, to the Lord for the people that he believed would be better suited for the position. But in the course of the Lord dealing with Moses, he clearly, you know, uh, accepted, submitted himself as well and became very passionate about the tax that the Lord has committed to his hands. And I want us to look at an example of where Moses exhibited passion. Remember the definition of passion again. It is someone who, I mean, it is you spending yourself to that thing that you are very passionate about. Now, let's read what happened here in Exodus uh, 32. We all are familiar with the story where the Lord God was really angry with the children of Israel and he wanted to destroy them. He wanted to destroy them. And let's see what the response of a passionate person was. Verse, I'm going to read from verse 9. It says, and the Exodus, Lord, Exodus went. Exodus 32 uh, from verse 9. Oh, Exodus 32? Yes. Exodus 32. I want to read from verse 9. Have you found it yet? Oh, it's, it's up to 22 years. Some reason, I don't know. You said that. Yeah, it's 32. Oh, I have it open. Okay, you don't worry. I will, okay. I will later I'll on go. Yeah, input it. All right. Okay, okay, no problems. Okay, so here it says that um, And the Lord God said unto Moses, I have seen these people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. Now, this is the Lord expressing hunger to his people that Moses has led all this while and is saying something interesting to Moses here, in, particularly in verse 11. And Moses besought the Lord, uh, um, saying, Lord, why does thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with mighty hands? Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountain, to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy wrath, fierce wrath, and repent of this evil against thy people. And, you know, Moses went on and on and was uh, placating uh, the Lord, interceding for the people. Now, remember that the very thing that the Lord has promised Moses here in this story, I don't want to read the entire thing, so I, because we, I'm sure we are all familiar, Every, everybody listening here, I believe our audience are familiar with this story. The Lord is promising Moses here that I will make of thee a great nation. I'm just going to get these people off the ground, get them out of the book, because... They continuously provoke me, but for you, I will make of you, you know, a great nation. Which, of course, Moses, being a, a, a Hebrew, 
knows that the Lord is able to achieve and accomplish whatever he promises. So he is confident that the Lord is able to do that. Okay? Because this is the same promise that the Lord made to Abraham. And the Lord, you know, lived up to that promise. And the Lord can do that in a shorter time. So it's not a bluff. God does not bluff. However, Moses, being a passionate person and not an ambitious person, stood in the middle to plead with the Lord. Even though the Lord was exempting him from that and promising to make him a great nation, these people who have even rebelled against the Lord, who have spoken against Moses many times, yet Moses was standing in the gap for them. This is an attribute of a passion reading, a passionate person. This is not someone who is ambitious. This is not someone who is looking for self-gains or self-gratification or self-glory. He is looking for one thing, that the cause of the Lord, that what Recording the in progress had started out is carried on to the end. That was the singular motive and the singular objective that Moses had. Okay, now, this is the story of Moses that helps to express passion, that helps us to understand what passion means. Let us contrast that to someone else who is a contemporary of Moses, who is, pas who is not passionate, but rather who is ambitious. And that is Bella. So, we all know the story of Balaam, but let's just read it very quickly uh, in Numbers. Uh, Numbers 22. Numbers 22. I'm going to just read from verse 12. 22 from verse 12. And God said unto Balaam, you shall, you shall, and God said unto Balaam, thou shalt not go with them. Thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. And Balaam rose up in the morning and said unto the princes of Balak, Get you into your land, for the Lord refused me to live with you. For the Lord uh, refused to give me leave to go with you. And I'm just going to jump to verse 15. And Balak sent so, uh, okay, let's just follow the order. And, and the princes of Moab rose up and they went on to Balak. We know that Balak is the king that had invited Balaam uh, to curse the people of Israel. And they said, Balaam refused to come with us. Verse 15. And Balak sent yet again princes more and more honorable than they. So what is Balak doing here is is enticing Balaam with uh, uh, sending to him eminent people. People who are the who, who is who in the, in the society that could, you know, cloud up the judgment of, of Balaam. That could cloud up the judgment of someone whose objective is actually ambition. Whose objective is, is directed towards themselves rather than the cause of Christ. Than the cost of God. So, and what happened? And they came to Balaam and said to him, Thus saith Balak the son of Zippor, Let nothing I pray thee hinder thee from coming unto me. And in verse 17, ba Balak starts to make promises to Balaam. For I will promote thee unto very great honor, and I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Come therefore, I pray thee, and curse these people, you know, now, not to go through the entire story, we all know that after many uh, pushing and uh, after many repeated seeking of God's face in court that Balaam did, he eventually, you know, bent towards the request of, of Balaam, uh, Balak rather, and went on to, 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 to do whatever he was 
seeking to do, which is essentially to curse the children of Israel. Of course, God hijacked that situation and turned it for the blessing of his people. But the lesson I want to bring out from here is to contrast that with the person of Moses. This is an ambitious individual, Balaam, who allowed self-gratification, self-elevation, and self-glory to be cloud his judgment and he did what was you know, not pleasing to the Lord. And that is in direct contrast to the, the prophet Moses, who was turned away from himself completely, but focused more on the objective of God, on the cause of God, which was to take his children, uh, the children of Israel, his people, to the land uh, that he had promised them. He was completely, you know, not looking at his own self-glory or his self-actualization, self but to the people. Even though God made that promise to him, that I will do this for you. I will make you this. I will make you a great person. Just, you know, let me destroy these people and put that against Balaam. You know, he also was promised, you will become great. I will promote you. I will make you such a great person. You just do this. Let these people be cursed. You know, look at the difference in the response from these two people. It helps you to understand, to conceptualize ambition and how it compares to passion. Okay, so that is one example. I'm going to use this example of these two people to say to everyone who is listening to this, including myself, uh, the Lord you know, speaks and he ministers things to you, uh, whether you're a preacher or anything that the Lord has called us into. The Lord ministers things to you. He wants you to share those things, but he's also ministering those things to the person who is the watchman, who is, you know, bearing that sharing. So a lot of times people might think that when someone is preaching, the person is exempt from what they're preaching. No, it is something that the Lord has ministered to this person and this person is only sharing it to you, okay? Sharing it with the people, all right? So I'm using this opportunity to speak to people who the Lord might have committed anything into our hands, whether it's by virtue, whether we are preachers, whether we are ministers, whether we are, whatever service it is that we are doing, you know, in the kingdom of Christ. There is... A difference between ambition and passion. And we always have to be careful because there is that thin line where we can think that we are we, we, we can think that we are passionate when in fact what is going on is ambition. We are you know uh, seeking for our own self, we are seeking for that self-gratification. So we will look at more examples before we make more comments. Now, the other two contrasts that I want to draw here is Paul and Demas. These are also two contemporaries who were around, you know, around the same time that exhibited these two behaviors, these two characters. And clearly, we know that Paul was a passionate person. Now, the example of where Paul where we can see the passion of Paul shining through is in Acts. Uh, someone made a comment in Acts. Uh, I think the people of Ephesus, let's just read it. Acts 17, verse 5, I believe it is. Yeah, so Acts 17, verse 5. It says, But the Jews which believed not moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort and gathered a company and set all the cities on an opera and assorted the house of Jason. We know that Jason was uh, um, the, 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 the head of the prison where Paul had been. And this was how the church in uh, Thessalonica was founded. This was really the story of the founding of the church in Thessalonica, right? But the, the, the part that I'm interested in is in verse 6. It says that, And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the ruler of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down 
are come either also. Now, this is this that that's been talked about here is basically Paul and Silas. So they're saying that Paul and Silas have turned the world upside down. It's just interesting to me that the Salonica is suddenly like a whole city, and just two individuals have been have, have been said to you know turn the the whole thing upside down. It is an expression for me. It is an expression of passion. How passionate these people were about what they were, you know, uh, talking about. And passion uh, and uh, Paul, Paul was not doing all of this uh, uh, for his own self, for his own self glory. We all know that Paul, in fact, was you know uh, told not to go to Jerusalem, and he has said that I'm ready, not only. To preach the gospel or to, 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 to be arrested, but I'm ready to even lay down my life. That is passion. That is someone who has been consumed by the, comp the, the entity for which he is passionate. That is not ambition. Ambition, people who are ambitious are not seeking to put themselves down. They are not seeking to get themselves out of the way. They are seeking to actualize themselves. With uh, they, they, they are just looking for that self-glory. And that is not what Paul is exhibiting here. Now, the other component, the other side to passion that I really want us to look at here, that uh, Paul is exhibiting here, and also Silas, in fact, is that these two people, just these two people, are said to have turned the whole place upside down. Right? The, the world essentially is upside down. And then when you are trying to make it right, it looks like you are turning it upside down. <laughs> okay, but the, the 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 point here is just these two individuals because of the passion that they carry. They 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 turn the city upside down. They turn everywhere upside down. You know, just because of that passion that they carried. Now, we can look at the story of Paul from different angles. Uh, Paul talking about how in his missionary journeys it was journey it was in peril of the sea of the sea peril of, of his countrymen you know uh, and many other ways that we can see Paul's passion coming through. I want us to contrast Paul to someone like Demas. Okay, now Demas, uh, interestingly, many people do not realize that Demas started very well. As seen in it's, uh, some scriptures where it was mentioned about um, some of those scriptures, uh, I'm just going to read one or two of that in Philippians 24. Uh, sorry, uh, Colossians 4:14. Apologies. Um, if we can just read that very quickly, I'm just going to pull that up on my device here. Bro Lawrence, if you can bring that up. Yep, you see it. Okay, so Colossians 4, uh, 14. Um, yeah, so here Paul was just greeting people. Luke, I um, mean, was just saying, I mean, talking to the uh, brethren in Colossians and mentioning the people who were working with him. Luke, the beloved physician, and they must greet you. So clearly, he was working in tandem with Paul initially, and who was, you know, very passionate. And obviously, he also came in there as possibly a passionate person at the beginning. Uh, but let's see. Down the line, we know we all know the story in Second Timothy 4.10. Uh, if we can just quickly go there. Second Timothy 4.10. He says, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. That right there is ambition, brothers and sisters. Demas, initially, Paul was mentioning that Demas greets you. He was a co-worker with Paul. Fast forward to, we don't know how long now, Demas has forsaken him. And the reason for Demas forsaking him is what is even more pathetic. He has loved this present world and is departed unto Thessalonica. Now, 
I want us to pay attention to the fact that when the Bible says, or when Paul is saying here that demons forsake him and love this present world, the prophet says that demons did not maybe go back into uh, some low down lifestyle, maybe, you know, went into the world and starts to run around with women or, you know, doing any of those things. It's not necessarily that. You know, demons might be someone who has his own ambition, who has his own, the way that he sees that Paul should conduct in the ministry. He probably has a bigger dream than what Paul is exhibiting. You know, and what happened? He forsook Paul to chase his own dream. That is an example of ambition right there. Brothers, it is easy for us to look at biblical characters and judge them and explain why they acted or look just judge them in a certain way without realizing that we ourselves can be caught in that very web very easily. There is a need for a daily check. Am I passionate or am I ambitious? Now, the problem with being ambitious is ambition does not get rewarded. Now, ambition does not necessarily mean that you will not have results. No. Balaam had results. He, he, he probably got what he wanted. Maybe he got the promotion, so he definitely didn't get it, but he had results. Otherwise, uh, the, the, the uh, Balak would not have gone to him. Okay? He had results. Now, the fact that you have results does not necessarily mean that it is passion. It could be ambition. The difference between ambition and passion, one of the differences that we've highlighted is ambition is seeking for self-glory. Ambition is seeking for self-actualization. But passion is all caught up in glorifying nothing but Christ. Even if it means that I'm all spent for it, I just want to glorify Christ. Now, I'm going to draw one more example to contrast two characters uh, for us to see. So, this is between Jesus, our Lord and Savior, versus Lucifer. Now, Christ, in uh, uh, the Bible verse that says that uh, for the zeal of his father's house had eaten him up. I think that's somewhere in John. Uh, if I can get that. But that's, that's a scripture that we're all very familiar with. For the zeal of his father's house had consumed him. The thing for which he was passionate had consumed him totally. He was not concerned about his, himself or his own self-glory but he was focused and concerned about doing the work and accomplishing the work of his father. Now, also in John 5, uh, 30, it says, I can of myself do nothing. I only do what the father shows me. That is not someone who is looking for self-glory. That is someone who is passionate about accomplishing what the father sent him. It says that... Um, in John 14, 10 again, it says, The work that I do, it is my Father who does the work. Uh, another place in uh, John 4, 32, it says, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. My meat is to do the works of him that sent me and to finish his work. This is, this is John 4, 32. And that is speaking clearly to someone who is turned away from himself to the concept for which he is passionate. This is not ambition. This speaks to passion. It says in John 2, 17, okay, so that's the one we just read. Um, the other one I wanted to read is, it says, my kingdom is not of this world. That's John 18, verse 36. My kingdom is not of this world. I'm not looking for anything here. I'm not looking for self-actualization. They were coming to make him by force a king. It says, I'm not interested in that. I just want to accomplish what the Father has sent me. My meat is to do the will of the Father and to, to, and to finish his work. 
That, is his, that was his focus. He was not concerned about himself. But let's look at the flip side to him, which is Lucifer. If we read about Lucifer in Isaiah 14, we all know that story, but I want to read it just for context sake. Isaiah 14, verse 12. Isaiah 14, verse 12. So this is the story of uh, how uh, the Lucifer fell uh, to become the, the, say, the devil that we know today. So if we read from verse 12, he says, How art thou falling from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Son of the morning. That's, that's, uh, that's uh, an, an interesting uh, uh a description for, for, for someone that has become the devil today. How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nation? Now, let us look at how that happened to him. How did he get that? How did he get there? Verse 13. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. Ambition. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregations in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high. This is someone who is ambitious. If we contrast that to Christ, who was seeking nothing of his own self, he made of himself no reputation, compared that to Lucifer, who was looking for nothing but his own reputation, then you understand ambition, and then that helps you to contrast that with passion. Christ was willing to lay down his life. He was willing to spend himself completely for this that he was passionate about, which is the work of his father. But Lucifer, on the other hand, who also was committed with the work of the father, you know, he was... The son of the morning. You know, he was the cherub that covered it. You know, he was, he, he had a, a significant position. But he was turning into himself. He was more interested in self-gratification, self-accomplishment. Look at what I've done. Look at what I've achieved than he was focusing on the, 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 the work of Christ progressing. Then he was focusing on spending himself like Christ did for what he was passionate about. That is something for us to think about, brothers and sisters. That is something for us to look within. Are we passionate or are we ambitious? Let's talk about passion a little bit. There is no Christian, there is no person who should, you know, uh, uh, be talking to other people or there is no one who looks at just what Christ has done, who looked at the love that Christ has shown to us in spending himself completely, who should not be passionate about Christ. Passion is what brings revival. Passion is what lights up other candles. Passion is what has brought about all the revivals that we've read about, you know, the world known revival. I was recently, uh, one time, reading about the Welsh revival. It's so interesting how this young man, somewhere in Scotland, was, his, his heart was pounding within him. He couldn't do anything else other than the fact that he was thinking about lost souls. He's, he was so caught up in it. He became a burden upon his heart. That is what passion is. Passion is a burden on the heart of an individual that consumes them that if they don't do it, if they don't carry out that task for which they are passionate, they may lose their sleep. It looks like they've done nothing. It looks like it just... Something just looks like they, like something is wrong with them until they carry out that. 
a task. That is passion. That is the burden of the Lord upon the heart of a man. As bearers of the truth, as watchmen, as believers of this truth, we should be passionate. We cannot accomplish anything without passion. Nobody follows uh, any. Uh, nobody follows the uh, 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 impassionate uh, concepts or something that you're not passionate about. But people listen to passion. People respond to passion. If someone is speaking from their heart, speaking based on the burden that is upon their heart, there is something in man that makes you respond to passion. However, what happens in, 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 if we look at ambition? Are we ambitious? There is a need to daily examine and check ourselves to see if we are not getting ambitious. Because you can't be passionate initially. There is a way that passion can turn out to become ambition. And that's an example that we see in Demas. Demas initially was passionate, obviously. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been with Paul. But over time, without him knowing, the passion gradually became ambition. So there is a need to always check to ensure that are we beginning to turn within to glorify ourselves, to seek self-gratification, or are we still concerned and ready to be spent to glorify the cause of Christ and to finish his work? Now, I was saying initially that ambition does not get result. I mean, does not do, do, may, may get result, but does not get reward. Why? Because God is not seeking to glorify a living being, a living man. God only glorifies one person. And that is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the only person that Christ, I mean that God, wants to be lifted up and to be glorified. That is the whole concept of the gospel. That is the whole concept of, of redemption. Because if everybody is drawn to Christ, what happens? The work is done. God is calling all his seed who have been lost, to be found in Christ. Because Christ is the safety soul who will not be destroyed. Christ is the place of mercy. Christ is the love of God expressed to mankind. Now, God is glorified in death. So I'm going to explain that. Because there is no way that we will not at some point get ambitious if we are not dead. God does not get glorified in a living, someone who is living. God is glorified in death. You know, I read a quote somewhere where someone was saying that the requirement for which God pours out his entirety into anyone is not to know more things. It's not to acquire more understanding. It's not to, to fast and pray. All of those are good, but the requirement to see more of God is death. How dead are you? How, how completely dead and emptied of yourself are you? God is glorified through death. God is not glorified through you know our living. So if you want to see an example, I, I think the first example that comes to mind is uh, Christ. He says that if I be lifted up, uh, I don't know if Brother Lawrence can help me get that scripture. It says that if I be lifted up uh, from the earth, I will draw all men unto myself. And that, the Bible says, speaks to his death. His death is what he was speaking to with that statement. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. Um, that John, John is, 12, 32. John 12, okay, I see that now. 
John 12, 22. Yeah. 32. 32. Okay. Thank you, brother. Yeah. Okay. And so it says, I'm just going to read from verse 30 here. It says that, uh, oh, sorry, my device is just a little slow here. Okay. Now I have it. Verse 30, it says, Jesus answered and said, the voice came not because of me, but for your sake. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And if and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Now verse 33. This he said, signifying what death he should die. He needed to die first for all men to be drawn unto him. He needed to die first for his actual glorification to happen. And God glorifies no man who is not. God glorifies no man. God glorifies only Christ. However, the only way that we can glorify God in, in turn for the love that he has expressed to us in Christ is by death. The death of our own concept, the death of the flesh, the death of our mind, and taking on the mind of Christ. Now, let's look at another example that shows us that man glorifies God by death. And that is, uh, I believe, in Luke. Uh, I hope I'm correct with that one. Is the story of Peter. Yeah, it's in John, sorry. John 21. John 21, 19. John 21, 19. John 21, 19. Now, uh, so verse, I, I, I would like to read from verse 18. So this is, speaking, this is Christ speaking to Peter. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou gettest thyself and walkest whither thou wished. But when you grow old, you shall stretch forth your hands, and another shall gird you and carry you where you do not wish. And the next verse, verse 19, truly, verse 19. Okay. This spake he, he spoke this, signifying by what death it should glorify God that's the part I wanted to use nobody glorifies God by anything other than death the death of the flesh I'm not talking about physical death I'm rather talking about you know mortifying the flesh this is how we glorify God Peter here the Bible is saying that this is that Christ was signifying by what death he was going to glorify God with. So, if we want to glorify God, then we need to die to all our ambition. No man should come to the altar, to the, to the place of the sacred ground of Christ, of, 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 of Christ, of, of, of the calling of Christ, for his own personal ambition. That is a Belamic ambition. That is a Belamic approach. It is not for self-gratification. It is not to achieve our self-goal. It is not. We cannot even be, start to talk about financial gratification. That, that is like the rock bottom of the, of, 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 the, of the matter. We should not even talk about that. That should never be the reason for which we have come to the altar of the calling of Christ. That is extremely sacrilegious. That aside, neither should we come, you know, with a self-ambition. It should rather be to spend ourselves, to be completely spent, so that the cause of Christ will be achieved, so that the kingdom of Christ will be built. We should be ready to spend and be spent for it not to achieve our own 
ambition or something that we have slated for ourselves. Not to try to be like someone else. Not to look at, oh, look at what this man has achieved. A man of God who has achieved this much. Oh, I wish I can be like him. Oh, I wish I can achieve. That is a wrong approach. That is self-glorification. That is ambition. That is not passion. That can never be rewarded. Any work that is done outside of a passion to see the kingdom of God built upon this in the heart of the people, in the church of God, is a work that cannot be rewarded. Because the singular thing that God is interested in is to build a kingdom for Christ. Is to prepare the people, the bride for the bridegroom. And that is the mandate of every singular watchman that has been called to the altar. And if we have a different ambition or a different focus or a different mandate, we are building a different uh, quality of bricks upon the foundation that has been laid. Christ is the whole uh, uh, is the is the is the the masterpiece. He has the masterpiece for the building for what the bride is going to look like, and the foundation was laid, you know, with passion for the work. So we should not bring in ambition, self glory. We should not be looking towards ourselves. We should never be lifting ourselves up before the people. We should not get into self uh, 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 competition or, or looking to be better than anybody else. That's because of ambition. That happens because we're ambitious. If we are looking towards Christ, then it doesn't matter who is doing what. So far the course of Christ is progressing. That is what we should be focusing on. That is what we should be striving towards. And when the cause of Christ is, 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 is being, being, being achieved, when our meat becomes to do the work of Christ, Christ is glorified, and we don't even care if we are spent, because we are passionate about it. We just want it to happen. Brothers and sisters, let us daily examine ourselves to make sure that we are not at any point being ambitious to the point of lifting or directing the people towards ourselves. The singular responsibility of every person who is called to the altar is to, to build the relationship between Christ and the people and to make sure that Christ is born and new in the mind of these people, to make sure that the relationship between Christ and the people is more cordial by the day. It is not to make the people come to them or to have a relationship with them, with the self of the person. If that is it, then the whole concept is defeated. The whole concept of you being a steward, a representative, that's the word, a representative, you're representing somebody. So the, 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 the mandate is to bring the people to the person that you're representing, not to ourselves. If we turn away from doing this or lose that vision, then the purpose is defeated. Brothers and sisters, I hope that we look into this and look at all these examples that we have highlighted. Jesus Christ and Lucifer. Moses and, 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 and Balaam, Paul and Demas, and there are many such examples of people who have exhibited passion. With passion, there is nothing that the Lord cannot do in our midst. There is nothing that the Lord cannot use us for. But with ambition, we are chasing the Lord away completely because He's not going to work with an ambitious person. No, because He's not looking to exalt anybody. But he's looking to exalt Christ. The prophet, the angel that appeared to him, said that if you remain sincere, sincerity is required 
for us to stay away from ambition. And that is what is the mandate that Christ has placed on us. I pray that the Lord will help us never to cross that thin line, because there is a thin line between passion and ambition. To remain passionate, to continue to live Christ in the minds of the people, and to stay away from whatever ambition, seeking to achieve this and that, seeking to be like somebody who's achieved something, the focus should be Christ. And may the Lord expand this in our hearts. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen and amen. The Lord richly bless you, Brother Gideon. Uh, when you look at the two words, uh, you will be tempted to say the two words are the same. The meaning of the two words are the same. But uh, we thank God our brother just brought out the difference clear, clearly unto us. You know, uh, we have been saved by grace, but that grace that we have been saved with should not be a license to do things just to uh, glorify ourselves. Hallelujah. Our brother said, yeah. uh, ambition is uh, doing something for self-glorification and self-actualization. But if you have a passion for the things of God, then you, whatever you do will only glorify Christ. And that is the main thing for every Christian to emulate. Hallelujah. When we are passionate, like uh, our brother rightly said, you know, passion, uh, people seek uh, uh, what? Uh, ambition. They, they become ambitious just to uh, get rewarded. But we are not doing that. We, as a born again Christian, somebody who has been saved by grace, we are doing that to glorify the Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. As Jesus Christ himself said, he, he came to what? In the volume of the, of the books to do the will of the Lord, the, the, the Father. Hallelujah. So we, we should also do that. We should also be passionate. If we are passionate for the things of God, that should be for Christ. And that will enable us to bring others to Christ. Like our brother said, the worst revival was the passion for Christ. And that sparked the revival. And through that revival, we have come to the knowledge of the truth of the gospel. Oh, my brother Gideon, we have been so blessed today. It was so uh, simple and straight to the point. Mm -hmm. And my brothers and sisters, as our brother has said, he has painstakingly taken time to write a book. And very soon, that book will be make, made available. And if you happen to, uh, I mean, f uh, grab your hands on one, just take your time, read it prayerfully, and you'll be blessed. Gideon, we are so blessed. May the Lord richly bless you and uh, bless your ministry, bless your family. And until then, my, my audience, this is where we have come to the end of yet another gospel bite. We come here to encourage, to share uh, with brethren of like precious faith. And we trust something has been said which has anchored if your faith in the Lord. We are living at a point where the word of God is cast. People are not being are fed with meat in due season the present truth but we are privileged that God has uh, chosen very, uh, uh, vessels that are anointed to speak his oracles we thank you and may the Lord richly bless you so Bragidion please just close us in a short word of prayer Amen Father in the name of Jesus Christ we thank you for no one oh God is in any way better than another person. Lord, you have called us, as our brother said, that we are saved by grace. And this grace, O oh God, is unmerited. No one was ever anything. No one is still anything. And you called us, you took us out of, from the dunghill, from nothing at all. Yes, Lord. Lord and then you, you, you made something out of us. You cleansed us. 
you you put great uh, clothes of righteousness upon us and now we look admirable oh god to the father lord here we are oh god just admonishing ourselves making sure that we don't slip into that ambition or whatever it means to each person it means different things it, it speaks to different uh, uh, levels depending on where people are you know, some people are looking for gratification for what they are doing in the in the work of in the in the service of the lord some people are beginning to have a, a, a high uh, expectation of uh, of what they should have achieved that is you know all you know fleshly driven lord that is different from passion it's not what we should have achieved or what where we should have attained or what we should be making now but rather it is oh God, what we should have done for christ amen lord the passion of a man says oh i've won how many souls for christ i've won just a thousand people for christ oh lord i've not done enough i'm looking i want to win one million souls for christ amen that is passion that is not ambition because that is driven away from that person that person is looking to be spent so that you know they can achieve more for christ lord that is where we want to be we want to be passionate people i pray father for myself for all the uh, brothers and sisters who are listening lord that you will Put your passion inside of us. Let the burden, O God, of your course, the course of Christ, Father, be ingrained into our minds, O God, that we will become very extremely passionate for the course of Christ and that the zeal, O God, of his, of his house will eat us up, O God. Amen. Pray, Father, that you will grant this to our hearts, O God. Give all our audience a great week as we go into it. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, bless our hearts, Lord. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. amen. So my audience, God bless you. Shalom. And we'll meet you again. God amen. bless you. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Ragidium. Amen.